Hi. <laughs> I'm Gordon Randolph Sharp. I was born in uh, February 12th, 1935 in uh, my grandfather's home on uh, <coughs> uh, face, the home faced on State Street, uh, but it had an address on uh, 7660 South State, which at that time was called uh, Mid Valley Avenue. Uh, <coughs> and the home was built in 1890, in the 1890s, and with a brick home, my uh, grandfather, Charles Philip Sharp, um, and his father, and with the help of others, built that home, uh, John W. Sharp was my grandfather, and Charles father I my parents were uh, George Randolph Sharp and Jane Del Quadro Sharp and I had six siblings we had nine counting the parents in our family and <laughs> we lived in the house for quite a while although <clears throat> there were some, three siblings came later uh, down the line, so the house was a little crowded, but not bad. It was, uh, had a big kitchen in it, and I really enjoyed being in the kitchen because a lot happened in that kitchen. My mom made sure that we had three meals. Uh, my mom and dad would dance on the kitchen floor and uh, they would sing songs which made it very delightful and mom generally had a smile in the morning almost every morning she had a smile and gave us a very good feeling when we got up for breakfast and came in for breakfast that I remember vividly and I think that set a good uh, memory for me. Uh, our family was happy and uh, we could uh, communicate very well. We all enjoyed each other's company basically pretty much. Um, my dad was a truck driver and his own sand and gravel business. My mom was the homemaker and uh, we lived with my uh, grandfather in his home. Uh, uh, he died when uh, I was about nine years old and so we stayed in the house. Now when <coughs> John W. Our, my great-grandfather uh, was in Salt Lake and Brigham Young had asked him to come down to Fort Union, which is now East Midvale, where we lived then. Uh, he asked uh, <coughs> my grandfather, Brigham Young had asked my grandfather to uh, go down and uh, homestead a, a section of land down in that area uh, called Fort Union at the time. <clears throat> so he he was the sheriff, actually my John W. was the sheriff in Salt Lake City. I uh, also want to mention another thing about my great grandfather uh, John W. Sharp that he was actually a bootmaker originally for Brigham Young when he first came to Salt Lake City and uh, as well as being, he was the sheriff in Salt Lake City a little later on. And Charles Phillip, my grandfather, was a sheriff as well. 
he followed my uh, my great grandfather's footsteps in that vocation. But he also was a farmer and grew uh, alfalfa. He had horses, uh, chickens, pigs. So he had a farm pretty much, and uh, <clears throat> we. Uh, we enjoyed his vegetable garden very much. He made wonderful uh, uh, he just made us very happy, my grandfather. He was a very good man. Uh, I remember a horse and buggy being in the excuse me a minute. Time out. And uh, my, my grandfather. <laughs> My grandfather, uh, he had a horse and buggy, and I'll never forget the horse and buggy. Uh, we uh, we enjoyed living there. Eventually, after my grandfather passed away, uh, we we stayed in the house and. The chickens were sold, all the farm was pretty well gone. Uh, my dad was not a farmer. <laughs> he drove his truck and he, he loved driving his truck and he made a very good living for us. So we did well that way. <clears throat> the, uh, we used to have a peony patch that my uh, grandfather had uh, planted and also snowball bushes lilac bushes, big front lawn. Uh, like I said, the house was on State Street. State Street was uh, started at the Capitol in uh, Salt Lake City and ended up in Santa Monica if you stayed on it, California. And uh, so we lived on that street. We would sell the peonies on that street and uh, every Memorial Day and uh, we had snowball bushes and peaches. Oh, fantastic peach trees. They were uh, Albertas, I think, and they were the best. And we always got them when they were ripe and sweet. And we'd have uh, uh, peaches and cream, and that was delicious. <laughs> we also uh, had uh, our uh, we had <coughs> milk delivered to our back door. Now Smart's Dairy was only a mile or two away, so uh, we used to have our milk delivered, and it was uh, straight from the cow. It was uh, what you'd call raw milk. It had half cream and half milk, and it, it came in a bottle, a glass bottle, with a little cap on it, and that's how the milk was was in those days, even if you bought them in the grocery store, they had a little cap on the top of the bottle. Well, he would come in the winter time and put it in the snow. And then it would freeze. And the cream would come up above the top of the bottle and the cap sitting on the top. Well, I'd get up real early in the morning and I'd go gingerly pick up that milk out of the snow. I'd bring it into the kitchen cabinet, set it on the cabinet, and I'd slide a bowl up to the bottle. And I'd take the cap off the top, and I'd get a knife, and I'd slice me ice cream it into the bowl. So I ate real ice cream in the morning. In the winter time, that was fantastic. I love that. <laughs> and my, we had a kitchen stove that was. Uh, I I would have to brush off the snow and the uh, and the coal off uh, the coal and the and the wood. I have to brush the snow off them, and I'd go gather that, and put a fire in the kitchen stove, which was a cast iron stove. And uh, we'd have to do that every morning to cook, cook on. And so mom would make homemade bread 
and we would cut that bread and put it on the stove to toast. And for some reason, that toast was the best tasting toast. Now, I think it was because of maybe a little smoke came from the fire or something, but it was so good. And then she'd make strawberry jam and we'd have strawberry jam and toast with our eggs and bacon and a good, good breakfast. So that was a delight. Uh, I, my dad built a, uh, a, a, up in a tree, he made a platform for me to climb up in and I got up in the platform and that would be my little, little place that I'd go up when I wanted to be by myself. And I'd have friends come up there too and, and we'd uh, you know, chat and have fun. And so that was, that was a delight. My dad, <clears throat> we had a big lot. And uh, <clears throat> actually my grandfather had, uh, he sold a lot of the acreage that we had and uh, they started building houses on it. Because in the depression it was kind of rough time. So he, he sold it for, for money to help him out and, and the family. And he uh, had uh, he had a uh, it was a hard worker, my grandfather, and uh, anyway, we had a big yard, big yard, and so my dad at the end of the yard. He and I built a basketball hoop and I wanted it 10 feet high because that's what the legal height was on basketball. So I learned how to pitch baskets and a lot of the neighbors would come and visit. And uh, <clears throat> one of them went to the University of Utah and played basketball. Jerry McClary and uh, after and I thought that was kind of cool. <laughs> okay, I want to talk about my siblings. Uh, my sibling Randy, um, Dolores Sharp was the oldest and Bonnie Lee, no Bonnie, oh Bonnie, Bonnie Sharp. <laughs> and then Marilyn Lee Sharp. And these were my three sisters that I grew up with. And then I came along. And then there was a 10 year span to the next siblings, which was Ted Sharp and Val D. Sharp and Karen Camille Sharp. Now I need to clarify with Ted because his name is now Charles Marlin Sharp. He had a couple of different names and I'm not sure what, what he ended up with. But anyway, that's my all my siblings and Randy and Bonnie used to tell me stories. We would sit in on the porch of the old house. On, on a swing, uh, we would uh, sit there and uh, talk about stories. They'd tell me ghost stories, scared me to death. And then they'd tell me other things that I really, uh, really enjoyed. I really enjoyed talking with those, uh, those girls uh, and looking out over the, the, the big lawn we had out in front and the lilac bushes, and it was just pleasant for me. That was a good memory for me. Now I have uh, the thing that uh, I wanted to mention was my... Your Italian grandma. Uh, not right now. I'm, I'm talking about my dad and his mother. 
and his mother died when my dad was about six years old. So I never really knew my grandmother, but I was able to live with my uh, her her husband Charles, and uh, that was uh, that was good times. Enjoyed that. Went out. We'd go out and. Uh, I used to go help Grandpa in the garden, and uh, uh, me and the girls would gather eggs in the chicken coop, and I'd have to feed the pigs, which we called slopping the pigs, which was not that much fun. But I really enjoyed the horses. But yes, uh, my dad also in <clears throat> they built another house uh, later on when the family expanded. We had uh, we had the four siblings. I had three sisters and myself. And then when I was about, I'm going to say, yeah. I'm not sure how old I was, but my brother Val came ten years, ten years after, and then my brother Ted came, and my sister Karen came after that. So we had kind of a little double family. My mother, my mother's side, she was half Italian. And uh, first of all, my, my father was English and Scandinavian. And so the Erickson side was my my grandmother that passed away earlier. Uh, my mother's side, she was half Italian, and her her dad, Raphael Della Quadri, he died when I was uh, born. So I never knew him. Gordon. But I had an experience that I really want to relate to uh, later. But right now, my mom uh, had, uh, I'm completely blank, I've got to keep my mind focused here. And I want to focus on my mom now. And she had uh, a couple of brothers. And the one was a younger brother, Ralph, and I had an experience with Uncle Ralph because when I had my, my hair would always fall in my face and it bugged me. And my Uncle Ralph always had this hair that was combed way back and looked really good all the time. And I asked him, I said, how did you get your hair to look like that? Because not everybody's hair looked like that. And he kind of chuckled. He says, well, he says, I used to have hair exactly like yours, and I started brushing my hair, and now it looks like this. And he says, if you start brushing your hair, maybe it'll go like mine. It did. I, br I used a brush all the time, every day, and that was a great experience to get my hair out of my eyes. And then my uncle um, Joe, he had the farm in Murray. That's where my uh, grandparents lived. And uh, he was coming, we pulled in his yard. Uh, we used to go visit him all the time and see my Aunt Liz and my uh, Grandpa Joe. And he was walking up from the farm with two crates of lettuce on each shoulder. He was a big guy. And those crates of lettuce were about two feet by three feet and, and, very, and kind of high, and they were filled with lettuce. And he was walking up from the farm with nobody with him, and he had a flatbed truck in the back of that farm, and he backed up to that truck and slid his lettuce crates onto the truck. And I looked at him, I was probably eight or nine, I said, Uncle Joe, 
how did you get those lettuce crates on your shoulders? I knew he couldn't have picked them up off the ground. And he, he laughed a little and he said, come on with me. So we walked down to the farm and on, on the road going to the farm, on the right side was the farm, big farm. He had a big, big farm. My mom was a farm girl. I mean, she worked on the farm. And he came upon, on the left side of that road was a, a big bank of dirt. And as we walked, we saw a dugout on the dirt side. And he backed up to that dirt pile, which he had dug out. And he said, I just put my lettuce crates on there. And then I pull them on my shoulders and go load them on the truck. And I thought, you know, Uncle Joe was a very smart man. Very smart man. And then my Uncle Mike uh, was my other, uh, my mom's other brother. And there's a little instance about this that I really, really loved Uncle Mike for. He was always coming over and they were talking Italian at the table and I really enjoyed listening to them. And uh, he was just a really good guy. Uncle Mike was a great guy. And uh, I was walking home with a friend of mine I grew up with, and he was heavier than I was. It was like a half a mile to the school and back. And we would walk home together, and uh, he would always started punching me and pushing me, bullying me. And I got tired of it. And I asked Mom, I said, what could I do? We put up our dukes after my Uncle Mike showed me what to do. And uh, he swung at me and I swung at him and I didn't stop swinging. I just kept swinging and I knocked him to the ground. And I looked at him and I said, do you want any more? And he said, no, no, that's enough. He got up and I never had any more problems with him at all. And we were still good friends. In fact, later on, Raymond Clements got me a job at North American Rockwell in El Segundo, California. And he was a, a, a machinist, in uh, a foreman of the machinist. And he told me that they were hiring and he got me on there. I actually ended up being a tool maker, which was better job in the machinist, but he actually got me that job later on. So we, we remain friends. I just wanted to mention one thing more about Uncle Ralph telling me to brush my hair. So I got a brush. I practiced brushing my hair and uh, I'll show you a, a picture of my high school picture that uh, the camera store on Main Street in Salt Lake City put this this picture in the window on display which I was kind of cool and my hair worked out with the brush. <laughs> I kept brushing it and pretty soon my hair looked like that. So that was kind of special for me and also on my mother's side, I said that I might have made a mistake by saying she was half Italian. She was all Italian. I was half Italian. <laughs> so I just wanted to clarify that. And uh, my grandmother, uh, on the Italian side, uh, I don't know if I told you before, but my grandfather on the Italian side died the same year I was and I didn't get to know him obviously. And so uh, my grandmother lived until I was about nine years old, I think. And so she no, knew no English. And we'd go visit her. And I remember looking at her. She'd be sitting in a chair. And uh, it was kind of funny that uh, she'd be looking at the newspaper upside down and my Uncle Ralph would have to 
turned the newspaper around and said, that's the way you read it. And she would laugh and I'd just look at her and we never really said anything other than with our minds and our heart. And she would smile at me and made me feel so good. I'll never forget her beautiful smile when she smiled at me and nod her head, yes. And so that was that was a delight. And she she obviously lived in Murray where Uncle Joe's farm was and that was actually my my great my grandparents house and farm and Uncle Joe lived with them and of course he took care of his his mom. Well, how did the Italians happen to uh, come here to the United States? Uh, the Italians came in the United States uh, back in, let me think when that was. I'm, I'm not thinking of the date right now, and I could get that later, but uh, my grandfather came with his brother Filippo, and uh, they caught a, a they took a train to, I think it was Nebraska, and then they took a, a covered wagon to Salt Lake City. And I believe it was in the, well, I'm not sure of the dates. Well, why did they come here? For work in America. Mm -hmm. They, they wanted to be in America the and they wanted to, I have no idea why they came to Utah of all places. And so they just followed, you know, went on the wagon train and settled in, uh, in Murray, in Murray, Utah. Well, what kind of work did they do there? Well, he worked at the smelter. Mm in Murray. That's that's what he was doing. Well, and, was then, he... and then they bought the farm on Vine Street in Murray. Was he married at the time? Oh yeah, they they were married in Italy. And so, and so he followed... they left uh, because they didn't have enough money to bring everybody. They didn't have mm -hmm. the money. So Uncle Joe and my grandmother stayed in Italy and then uh, he had them come when he had enough money to pay their way and they came to uh, Utah and that's when I guess by that time he probably bought the house and the farm and they moved into the uh, house and the farm later on so yeah that's that's their story so uh, it was uh, uh, fun going over to the Italian uh, house in Murray for me. I enjoyed that and talking to my Uncle Joe. I wanted to talk a little bit about my dad at this point uh, because he had uh, had his trucking business and he used to overhaul his own motors on the truck and so he was a mechanic and I'd help him hand him tools. Mom always wanted me to hand him tools to help him work on his truck. So he taught me how to work on uh, car motors. He helped me buy my first car, which was a 1944, a red 1944. And uh, I had to do some mechanic work on it. And so he showed me how to do that. And I learned a lot. Uh, on that on that car and I <clears throat> so he he really helped me a lot on any cars that I had and if I had trouble with the cars so I I used to own a lot of cars and I enjoyed cars I had a uh, uh, Let's see, what did I have? I had a nice Oldsmobile 
and Super 88, 1955, and I had, uh, well, I had this one car that I bought uh, when I was uh, later on in high school, and it was a really nice car. Uh, so I, I wanted to keep it in a garage, but I didn't have a garage, so I looked up in the paper to buy a garage. And I found a paper in Salt Lake City that they wanted to sell their garage. It was a single car garage and a nice white, wonderful roof. And I, I paid less than $200 for it. I think it was $150 or something like that for it. And uh, uh, when I, uh, I need a, a back off just a little bit here now and I'll tell you how we got the garage home, my dad and I. But I, when I was working, uh, I started out on a paper route. And Jim Cundit gave me his paper route. And then later on, uh, he was my neighbor and we run around a lot together and good friends and did a lot of a lot of good things and uh, anyway we he got me a job at uh, Save More Market which is a grocery store so I learned a lot about the grocery business and I also uh, from there I went to the building business I was able to get a, a good job uh, and uh, Grant Martineau got me a job and I started uh, from learning how to build the basements and the, and the main part of the house and the roofs. And I also learned how to finish cement uh, at these uh, different houses that Grant was building. Then he had me uh, repair some tile on the roof of his house uh, by myself and he showed me what to do and I went up there and repaired the tile and he was very happy about that. So he got me a job at Jordan Builder Supply, which was a business in West Jordan that he owned. <coughs> and I, he uh, gave me the opportunity to drive his lumber truck to and from Salt Lake uh, to supply his uh, business. And I felt really good about that because I think he trusted me. And I think uh, trust was given to me by my parents and so I felt like I was a trustworthy person when I started thinking about different things later on in life and uh, so anyway. Grandpa, can you say about how old you were during all these Oh this jobs? was uh, when I had my paper out I was I started out at uh, uh, 12 years old and I had it till I was 15 and then I went to part-time work when I was going to high school at the grocery store so I did that after and then after I graduated from high school I got the uh, job as a builder and in, in, in building homes and uh, so I was what, about 18, 19 when I started that. And uh, and then, so Grant had a big 16-foot flatbed truck. And I asked him if I could borrow it for the weekend. And so he said, sure. So I took the truck. My dad and I drove the truck to Salt Lake City. And we... Uh, went to where I had bought the garage that I uh, spoke about earlier. And I bought the garage and so all we had to do is undo some bolts and put some boards on the side of the garage and a, and a board across the uh, bed of the truck. And with house jacks we actually raised the garage up high enough to put the boards that were, that were used on the truck under the boards that were nailed on the, on the garage. 
And then of course we had to put a board across the front so it wouldn't spread with the wind. And uh, we tied it down really good on the truck. And uh, you have to realize this garage was about 18 feet long, I think. And the truck bed was 16 feet, so it hung over a little bit, but it pretty well sat on the garage. And so we drove almost 12 miles with that truck <laughs> down the road, and there wasn't much traffic in those days, so we didn't have to worry about laws or anything. We put a red flag on the back and all that business. And uh, we drove it down there to our house in Midville, East Midville, and uh, my dad had put some good gravel, heavy gravel and stuff for a base, a base for the garage to sit on and, and then some tubus 12s to uh, set it down on the, uh, the garage set down on the tuba 12. And we just backed it in, lowered it down and uh, with the house jacks and uh, I had myself a wonderful garage with a working door that uh, closed and I locked it. So it was really uh, a good experience and uh, I had that experience with my dad. He was, he was very smart about things like that and I have to really hand it to my dad for helping me there. So that, uh, that part of it was uh, kind of interesting. Now, I'm trying to see where I'm going now. Uh, oh yes, I had a lot of cars and so I had this nice nice car that I put in the garage so it would be protected. And uh, I also bought a motorcycle and I rode motorcycle. Gordon Tripp and I would ride my motorcycle around and so Oh, in high school, I forgot to tell you that I was a cheerleader for two years, and I did that in high school. I was small for my age, so I couldn't play football, which I love football, but I did play a little tennis uh, in high school, and a good friend, Glenn Kundick, was my very good friend and tennis buddy in high school. So I wanted to just mention that. Uh, my my uh, brother Val and I took a nice ride um, to Vernal, Utah with our sleeping bags and uh, we rode across uh, Highway 40 up by Strawberry Reservoir and on the way to Vernal um, with our shirts off. That's how hot it was. It was like 90 degrees or something. So we get to Vernal and I've been going to the University of Utah and this fellow at the University of Utah said, I live in Vernal and my folks have cabins there and you're welcome to one of the cabins if you want to stay there overnight. And, uh, and so he gave me a key to one of the cabins and we stayed at a cabin in Vernal and uh, put our bags on the floor and, and then we just took off up into the Uintas up in northeastern Utah and there's like the land of the thousand lakes there's lots of beautiful beautiful country up there and so we rode to the top and there was this wonderful lodge that had just opened and thank goodness because we were very hungry and, and Val and I went in and had a wonderful hot cakes and eggs and the whole thing. And we ate that <clears throat> and then we took off across that, uh, oh, it was about probably at least 7,500 miles across the top. And the road was very flat. For, long, long way. So we drove a long way, then we stopped and we fished by uh, Blair Lake up on top and we ate some fish, just 
cooked them on the rocks and ate some fish. And then uh, Val and I took that motorcycle and we drove right down into uh, Wyoming, Evanston, Wyoming. So we we're making a big circle from Salt Lake to Vernal to Wyoming, well, to the Uintas and then to Wyoming. And we went down to Wyoming and boy, that was, that was back in the early 50s. So Evanston was still a cowboy town. And there was a lot of, uh, it was interesting how so many cowboys were there and they still had boardwalks and it was kind of fun to see. And then from there we took off to go to Salt Lake and believe it or not, it snowed. And to this day I can't imagine how it could be so hot in Utah. And then I guess a cold front came down and it wasn't a, a heavy snow, it was just a very light uh, flicker of snow coming down so it didn't affect the road because it was cold enough to not stick on the road at the time. And uh, we rode home and then finally got this, uh, it, it kind of subsided, the snow uh, subsided after a while. And then, of course, we were bundled up in whatever, you know, we had clothes, coats and things. And then we uh, uh, went on down to Salt Lake. And that was a wonderful trip that Val and I took on the motorcycle. I don't know if I told you that I used to go pheasant hunting with Gordon Tripp. We had wonderful times. Uh, he was a wonderful friend. I knew him in primary. So I knew him all my life. And he was my best friend. And when we got out of high school, we, we went hunting and fishing. Did a lot of, lot of good stuff. Lot, lot, lots of fun. And he was, his mom and dad were uh, good church members and he was as well and so we we had a lot in common and I, m I remember my boys used to go pheasant hunting with us and that was a delight to have them come a couple of times and, and just really enjoy the pheasant hunting and I remember one time after we'd walked the field and gotten very hot we went into Salina Utah's uh, drugstore and and they had a soda fountain in there that had the milkshakes with the tins so you got a lot of milkshakes and and I challenged Gordon to dr drink drinking milkshakes who could drink the most milkshakes he ended up drinking three and I drank four I just love milkshakes so that was fun fun stuff and uh, we we had some good times there, uh, many, many years of, of uh, being with him, and uh, he was uh, he was the superintendent of of the uh, Grant School District uh, maintenance department, and uh, him and I would go to different places that he worked, and same with uh, me, he'd go to. We just uh, worked together building and remodeling some uh, homes inside and and so we we had a good rapport and it was fun to know him. I just wanted to add this in because he was a very good friend of mine. So from there I went, I started at the University of, I was going to the University of Utah as I had spoken earlier about the fellow I met there and he lent us the cabin. And so I was going to school at the university and I actually went about a year and a half and I loved the choir. I took choir uh, twice at the university because I just loved to sing and I was singing in my high school choir prior to and uh, Richard P. Condy was my director 
and he actually ended up directing the uh, Tabernacle Choir in Salt Lake City after uh, I left uh, the university and he uh, he taught me how to sing Hallelujah Choir chorus which was fantastic and I I remembered that song many years and I just really enjoyed singing. Uh, I think I got it from my parents who loved to sing and all, all of us siblings too as well. And so anyway, um, I, I went a year and a half to college. In the meantime, I hired in at Kennecott Copper and I went to work there. Um, I worked there for actually eight years and I drove to Kennecott and then I drive to the university to do my studies. And uh, so I kind of kind of did that and uh, uh, when I worked at Kennecott, it was 17 miles away up on the hill on the west side of town and I'd have to drive all the way up to the University of Utah which is quite a, quite a chore. So anyway, I, uh, I decided to, uh, from going from uh, college, I decided to, I don't want to forget anything in between here, so I think I pretty well covered uh, my uh, younger life, so I went, I decided to move to California because my mom and dad had moved to California earlier and Randy and, and Mel, her husband and their children, decided to move there too. So they were there and uh, I really uh, liked the idea of California, we'd taken a lot of trips there, and <coughs> excuse me. And our uh, my aunt Chill <coughs> and Uncle Lloyd lived in California. We would go visit them a lot, and they would come and visit us when we were very little in Utah. And Uncle Lloyd was just so friendly, and we just loved Uncle Lloyd because he made us feel so good all the time. And so, so I went to California. I lived with Randy and Mel for a short time, and then uh, he. Uh, uh, I worked actually in California. I I worked. I lived with them for a short time, and then I went to. Uh, uh, he found uh, an apartment with some missionaries to live with. So I, I returned missionaries, and so I lived with them in Lakewood, California, and I was about, oh, I'd say, I think I was 29 when I moved, 28 or 9, and, uh, and so I, uh, from there, I, drawing a little blank here, but where am I going now? Oh yes, um, I started working as a carpet cleaner, estimator, so I sold carpet cleaning jobs, and it was a, a, a good job. Uh, it slowed down in the winter. So I didn't have many jobs and I had the opportunity to uh, go in the ambulance business. And this was before paramedics existed. 
And so the ambulance people would uh, uh, do the ambular work for anyone that was in need and, you know, car crashes to people sick in bed. And so we, we uh, had uh, some instances there. I, I remember, I remember one time I was uh, not driving ambulance at first, and <clears throat> I'd just gotten the job, and we got a call that there was a fellow that was shot in the street in Long Beach. And we found out that the fellow that shot him was in his hotel room. And that fellow said that if if that, that guy is pushing my car out of the parking lot onto the street, and if he gets my car onto the street, I'll shoot him. So when we got there, he had shot him, and it's kind of a belly wound. And that was the first time I'd ever seen a gunshot wound. And it was kind of, kind of a little nerve-wracking, nerve but <clears throat> we had to pick that fellow up. We took him to, of course, he was uh, robbing a car, so we had to take him to General Hospital in Los Angeles, where they actually put him in jail and, and doctored him up. And so that was quite an experience. And <laughs> I had a lot of experiences in the ambulance business. I actually started driving ambulance, and that's, uh, that was uh, quite an experience. I had a number of things uh, that were very tragic, and, 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 and a couple of times I actually saved a woman's life, uh, a couple of people's life, one woman especially, and, and another person's life uh, by picking them up, taking them to the hospital. And so that was, uh, that was really a delight that I could help people. And, you know, that reminds me of a story now of, I, I came about uh, meeting uh, my first wife, Martha Jane Babb, and she had just joined the church, and of course I did want to uh, marry a girl that joined the church, that was a member of the church, and she had a daughter that without a husband, and so uh, her mother pretty well took care of the daughter for the first year, and then uh, when we got married, uh, she, uh, Kim, lived with us, and then we had uh, three children, and we, we did, uh, I worked, I worked a lot, um, I was working to try to, uh, you know, we bought our first home, in, uh, in Long Beach, on Petaluma Street, East Long Beach. And I had uh, saved up some money, and I had a nice car that I actually sold so that we could buy the house. And I bought a little old station wagon that was very inexpensive and that kind of kept the wheels going. And uh, by this time I had uh, the opportunity to uh, get a job. The ambulance business was 24 on, 24 off, so I actually had the opportunity. Uh, this friend of mine, uh, Raymond Clement, that I knew earlier in uh, life, he called me up and uh, he knew I was in town and he s said that uh, the, uh, 
they're opening up at North American Rockwell, so he got me a job there, and and I was a, ended up being the tool maker, and it was very very good money, and so we were able to uh, uh, first the uh, first part of our marriage we lived behind a garage, and then after that we saved money and, and got the pedal room home. And uh, so we had a, we had a <coughs> nice home there in Long Beach. <coughs> Excuse me. And so uh, we went on, <coughs> uh, had our three children. Uh, there was some uh, few tough times we had. My mind's kind of blank a little bit. How are we going? Good. Oh, I was just making sure. Children's names. And uh, our children's name was Kimberly, Jill, Bab, Sharp. <laughs> and then uh, the first uh, that was born in our family was uh, Gregory Todd Sharp. And then the second child was Stephen. Steve Christian. Stephen Christian Sharp. And then Heidi Michelle Sharp. That was our little daughter. And so uh, I was working, driving quite a ways from Long Beach to. Uh, to El Segundo, Utah, uh, California, El Segundo, California, and so it was a long drive, and <clears throat> and I worked there and <clears throat> trying to make ends meet and all. So uh, we actually needed a bigger house, so I found a a, a house that was a year old. We could assume the loan, so financing was always a big interest to me and anything I did as far as cars or, or buying cars and selling them and same with the house. And so we found a, a good enough deal to move in. We could still pay the payment. Okay. You're on. Hi, this is Gordon Randolph Sharp. Round three. <laughs> Thought uh, we'd uh, go for it. Hopefully, uh, we can get through it today about my life story. Yeah. And <clears throat> we were talking about buying a house in Cerritos, California, just off Gridley Road. And uh, the financing was. Uh, uh, very comfortable for us, so we were able to take care of that and move into this nice home that was only a year old. And uh, so we enjoyed that part of it. I was able to fix it up and make it a nice home. And, and, uh, and <clears throat> Relandscaped it and uh, did did a lot of work. I actually poured uh, nine yards of concrete myself, knowing how to do concrete work, and then uh, the other uh, I think it was another 25 yards in the back for a full patio, big big patio, and. Uh, it turned out uh, really nice. We uh, <clears throat> we were able to to have uh, our uh, uh, one time during New Year's. I wanted to have uh, homeless people or or underprivileged people come to our house, and so we we. Um, sent out notices that we wanted to have that and uh, and it was surprising when the neighbors once found out that we were doing that 
They all brought over gifts and we actually had a Santa Claus come. And we didn't order him, he just came. And it was so great to have those kids and a and, uh, little bit ragged muffin. You could tell that they were they were uh, children that uh, needed help, and and that was uh, I felt really really good about that. And uh, anyway, we we uh, <clears throat> trying to uh, think with an 84 year old mind and uh, uh, about a stage four cancer, so. You'll have to excuse me if my mind kind of drifts off at this point. But anyway, I, uh, <clears throat> the uh, children uh, enjoyed their new home and uh, we, uh, I was able to uh, drive to work pretty quickly from there. And so, all in all, it turned out to be a nice, nice move for us. We actually bought a, a new uh, Chevy Chevelle station wagon, uh, which was nice. And uh, so financially, we were doing okay. And that was the important part of all this. And so <clears throat> we went to... Uh, um, I still worked at Rockwell at the time, and I worked there for five years. I, uh, now where do I go? Hmm. I worked there five years, but I, I got laid off because it was government contracts. And, uh, we, uh, We had to go, I had to go to a job shop to get a job after that, which was a different kind of work. I learned how to do machine shop work there, and it was, uh, it was interesting work. And <clears throat> so, I uh, worked there for uh, a year or so, and and then uh, I actually, oh, before I got that job, I worked for Bridgeford Foods and it was driving a truck, a truck delivering uh, food to all the different uh, uh, small stores and uh, small, uh, I even delivered to wineries and uh, and mostly just delicatessens, things like this. And so I worked there and I actually uh, won a tent getting new customers. Got a beautiful 11 by 11 tent uh, for the family. And I won that just selling uh, new things to other customers because they were they had, uh, I don't mean to close my eyes all the time, but I'm trying to think. <laughs> uh, I was uh, going to, uh, uh, on the way, on, on, on the way to driving on my other, on my old customers, I didn't have many customers and I had to drive up to Fontana, so I kept stopping into these different rest, uh, uh, little stores, and they said, "Well, that's uh, that's a good thing. You can you can." Uh, <clears throat> uh, I was able to talk them into uh, knowing that I would rotate all their stock so they'd have fresh stock all the time, and they liked that. So I was able to get new customers. And that was a that was a good job, and I, the biggest customer I got was Fontana uh, Aluminum, uh, Kaiser Aluminum in Fontana, and I started 
uh, pushing two cartloads of uh, these heavy lunch meats and hams and, and different things. And I, I think that uh, I really, I, I think that the, uh, uh, when I went to uh, Fontana and pushing those carts, I thought, well, what have I got here? <clears throat> I'm pushing these heavy carts, I'm making good money, and yet, if I go higher up, to make a little more money for uh, different positions. And these guys were kind of young that were above me and they had uh, bad backs, both of them. And I thought, you know, I think I'm cruising for a bruising here. I don't think I should do that uh, job anymore because it was, it was carrying heavy lunch meats and it wasn't pleasant on my back. And I've been pretty mindful of my back all my life because I had a little instance where I, in high school, where I had a, a back problem and I got a massage and it took care of it. But I didn't want to have any more back problems. So I quit the job. Got a job shop at, uh, as a machinist. Uh, the one I was talking to you about previously, and the uh, so I got the uh, job shop job, and I learned a lot there. It was very interesting work, and I uh, continued on there. They would have me work overtime, which was 10 hours a day. And, and so I worked it. Uh, and then McDonnell Douglas started hiring. Well, I was working day shift at the job shop. And McDonnell Douglas was night shift. And I figured it out, if I got a job at Douglas, I could work both places. And that's what I did. I worked both places, and then all of a sudden, both of them wanted me to work Saturday. So I had to quit the job shop, because the Douglas job was so much better. And so I, I quit that, and went, uh, went on. And then, uh, <clears throat> I worked at McDonnell Douglas, I got laid off there, so we decided to move to Utah. So we moved to Utah, and I actually got almost as much money as I was making when I was working. Excuse me. And so I was doing pretty good there. So we moved to Utah and bought a house on 7th East. And about 33rd South, and uh, and so we uh, we lived there for a little while, and we took the rest of our money and put the down payment on a new house up on Hickory Hill by the mouth of uh, Brighton Canyon, and that was a beautiful home. We moved there fixed it all up, and did a, a big job on, uh, I had a lot of rocks in the front, and I had to pull all the rocks out and, and uh, till it, and, and Darnell, my brother-in-law, gave me, uh, that, that's uh, Bonnie's husband, Darnell, he gave me a truckload of the cow manure, and I took it over there and dumped it on there and had the best lawn in the whole neighborhood. It really turned out well, and I put some cement work in and, and did a lot of landscaping there and helped help, uh, me, me and another fellow 
uh, our neighbor, uh, he was in real estate and he <laughs> helped me put up my fence and I helped him put up his fence. Well, come to find out, he bought some house up on the hill, up on the mountain in uh, Utah, and he'd done really well in real estate, and he had a mansion up there. And so it was interesting to uh, get to know him when we were building our fences. And then, uh, and then I got I got a job at Imco which was a very dirty, uh, smoky, uh, not a good place to work. I did that for about six months as a machinist. And just by uh, my bent over a machine all that time. And then I had the opportunity to go to work at Deseret Industries. That, uh, Deseret uh, Pharmaceutical Industries. And that was a really change of pace because it was, you could have eaten off the floor in that shop. And I helped uh, uh, the designer build a machine that, that glued a sponge on a brush. We made the brush, but we didn't make the sponge. We had to buy the sponges. And I had a lot of suggestions in that design and the designer really, really liked me for it. Later he tried to get me to stay in Utah and by getting me a job at Lear Jet and I, I turned that down later. But anyway, uh, uh, we, that, that little brush and, uh, and sponge it's called Easy Scrubbing, and they still have it in some of the doctor's offices here in L.A. So I thought that was uh, rather an interesting thing. But they had a they had a fallout on one of the supplies, and uh, we they had to lay off about four people out of the shop. I was the first one hired, so I was the la first one fired, or the last. Let's see, wait a minute. I was the last one hired and the first one laid off. So I had I went to California and got a job at uh, I think it was McDonald Douglas again. They, they were hiring again when I got back and I went to work there and then I moved the family back later and uh, then uh, we bought a, a house in Cerritos, actually a couple of houses in Cerritos, and uh, Trina, oh. <laughs> and uh, and so <laughs> Trina just called, but I turned off the phone. <laughs> Sorry about that. Sorry, Trina. <laughs> And so, uh, excuse me, we, uh, I worked at McDonald Douglas and we moved to Cerrito or to Cyprus. I bought a couple of houses there, one first and then a bigger one second. And the bigger one was a big old, it was a mess. Was it a cul-de-sac? Well, the bigger one wasn't a mess. It was a beautiful home. It was a beautiful home, but the surroundings were not good. And when I say that, across the street was a, a, a fellow that was on drugs. And he, he would open the garage door and he would say all kinds of bad words, talking on the phone right at the garage door. And we could hear it because we were at a cul-de-sac and there was a brick wall uh, at the dead, it was the dead end uh, of our street and our houses faced each other along the brick wall. And uh, he would come off with those bad words while I was working out front and I told him, I called it out and I said, please don't say those words. I says, 
I have young children here and, and I don't want them to hear these bad words. And yeah, 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 you know, he gave me a bad time. We started talking and he says, you're a big man, just come on over. So I took a couple of steps into the driveway. I wasn't going to hit him or anything. I was just going to talk to him. But he uh, hurried up and closed the garage door and went out. So I went up the door and knocked on their door. And all of a sudden, it sounded like the kitchen sink hit the door. I don't know, he threw a book or something. It made a tremendous noise. So I ducked around the corner. Then I went up and knocked again. And nobody came to the door. And so, a little later on, I was still working out in front. His mom had been home. I knew she was home because the car was in the garage. And she came out like she was going to go somewhere. She opened the garage door and walked out in front of the garage door. And I said, say, could I talk to you a minute? And we'd, we'd only lived there two weeks, not even that. And uh, so I walked up to her and I think she got the surprise of her life. Because she thought I was going to... She heard all the commotion, I'm sure, that was going on. And I just walked up to her, Hi, I'm Gordon Sharp. I'm your new neighbor. We just moved in a couple of weeks ago. And, and uh, I just wanted to introduce you to myself and, uh, and our family. And uh, uh, what was your name? And she gave me her name. And then I told her what her son had done, and she, she probably already knew it. Her bedroom was just above the door, garage the door. And uh, these houses were all kind of built the same. And a lot of the bedrooms were above the garage door. They're called a Greenbrook home. They were beautiful homes, gorgeous homes, but they were all were sort of a little bit alike. And so, Anyway, uh, she listened to me about what her boy had said, and and he, she turned around on him, and I literally felt sorry for the boy because the way she put him down. I mean, it was like she just put him on the ground and stomped on him with verbiage. It was so sad to hear. So sad to hear. How old was the boy? Oh, he was uh, 12, maybe 11. Oh, not a teenager? No, no. Just a, yeah. No. And, uh, but a pretty bad teenager as far as drugs went, uh -huh. you know. And later on, I saw the boy uh, uh, going to, uh, coming home from school, and I offered to, uh, I offered to give him a ride home, and he turned it down, but he really, I could tell he appreciated me asking that, just by the look on his face. And I never had any problems with him ever again. Ever. It was beautiful. And then I was coming home from work one day and uh, there was a fire in a, tra in, in, in a five gallon drum that used for trash and put uh, palm leaves in it. And uh, that fire was up above the can and there, there was a palm tree up above, and the palm tree was catching on fire. So I pulled over right away, and I told there was the boy there that lit the fire, about three boys, and I said, pull that can out of the way. Pull it out of the way. So it wouldn't burn on the tree anymore, but it was still burning on the tree, and just then the wind come up, 
blew the palm, palm, palm from over across the street onto uh, Vista del Sol where I lived. The first house on Vista del Sol and lit the roof on fire. No. So I ran up to their door and I says, call the fire department. Your roof is on fire. Call it now. And she called it right away and they came and, and they just remodeled the living room and they had about a seven foot hole in their, in their roof. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, what a sad situation. I mean, it was, it, it was kind of comical in a way. It's amazing how... But you saved their house because uh, of that. If you hadn't been there? Yeah, if I hadn't been there. Mm -hmm. It could have burned mm -hmm. the house down. Yep. And uh, so, crazy stuff, you know. <laughs> so, and the kids now I'm really doing well with, and I'm so happy about that. Oh, so happy. And so, excuse me. <laughs> <coughs> Life goes on. I had a real tough time and the divorce man, divorced men have uh, more problems than women because women are able to talk amongst each other a lot and men tend not to and they're like the breadwinner and they don't talk amongst the men so much and and it's harder on a man, I found out. And anyway, so I just thought, well when was I the happiest? Obviously this was the worst time in my life. And when was I the happiest? When I was the happiest Things obviously were good. And when I went to church, it was all good. And I was happy going to church. But I, I got to go back to church. And uh, so I'm, I'm sitting, I, I'm laying under my VW, my yellow VW, and, and I'm looking and, and I see four uh, black shiny shoes walking towards me. And so I poked my head out from under the car and the elders quorum president and the first counselor and the bishop was there and they invited me to church. And earlier I had asked Randy to uh, have the bishop or someone from the leadership of the church in Cyprus First Ward to to invite me to church, take take literally take me to church. That's the way I felt, and so they invited and they came the next Sunday and took me to church. And I've been going to church ever since that was 1982. And, uh, and while I was going to church, I, Bishop Kessler asked me if, uh, he asked me if I would be ward representative, single representative. And I says, oh, single representative? He says, yes. And I, I says, well, sure. Well, what do I do? And he says, well, I don't know. We've never had one in, in our ward. <laughs> but I'll find someone from another ward and they can come over and show you. And so they, uh, they came over and then I, I took and... Uh, I gathered all the single people in the ward and took them to movies and or we all went to movies 
and dances and single conferences. And it really turned out really a blessing to me because I really uh, loved going to the single conferences and uh, they had so many good seminars. It cost us $35 for a Friday night and Saturday night dinner and dance. And then Sunday where they had, we had uh, uh, our sacrament meeting and uh, the uh, sacrament meetings and then we'd have seminars. Actually, we had seminars on Friday and Saturday. That's what it was. And then we went to church on Sunday. But those seminars were beautiful. Self-esteem, build up, anyone that was divorced or had problems, a single, they were all designed for that, didn't cost us any extra. And these teachers were just fantastic, just fantastic teachers. And that really, I, I've got a file full of all those seminars, most of them anyway. And, uh, and I re I've, I've referred back to them more than once since. And so I started going to the single dances all the time. And I ended up going to this single dance in Norwalk. And it was actually in the town of Norwalk, but it was a downy single dance. I don't know how that came about, but that's what it was with the Downey Dance in Norwalk. And I go to that, and I was always one, even in high school, I was always the first one to go choose a girl to dance with, because I couldn't stand just looking at the girls on the other side of the gymnasium at high school, and the boys on the other side look at each other, and we're supposed to be dancing. And that was beautiful Glenn M M Miller, music and so I'd be the first ones to go so I did that all through my single life you know when I'd go into uh, these church dances I'd always pick out anybody especially that I didn't know and had come in on the scene of the single scene because I was I was looking for someone to marry just like uh, the Bishop Kessler said he Go out there and, and do it, <laughs> as President Kimball would say, do it. So I went out there and uh, I was walking towards uh, Sandy Maddox, who was a divorcee, and she had come to that dance with Marianne Manicone and uh, and so, Dunham, <laughs> she's got a lot of names. And so, uh, best one is a sweetheart. <laughs> and anyway, so we, uh, I started walking towards the, the couple and uh, Marianne was kind of very shy and very serious faced, uh, not a smile one, but kind of a 45 degree angle off Sandy. And as soon as I got closer, I saw that, I saw Marianne's face. Huh. I can't tell you what it did to me. Something in my heart went thump, thump, thump. And uh, I, uh, I just looked at her face and I thought, wow, there's a lot going on there. A lot. Ahem. <clears throat> I think the Lord had brought me to that dance. So I walked up and 
asked her to dance. I didn't know whether she would because she wasn't smiling much. And she did. She said yes. So I started dancing with the regular dances. And I'd done a lot of Western dancing. I was dancing four times a week. I was doing a lot of dancing in those days, and including clogging. I had one day, one night of clogging. The other three were mostly Western dance and regular dance. And so I asked Marianne if she'd ever done the Western Western dance. Still going. Mm -hmm. And she says no, and I says, well, I've I've taught a number of people to do it. I think I can show you how to do it. She says, okay. So we did it. And after we went around the floor one time, she had it. She, she had it figured. And uh, she looked up at me and smiled. Woo! That was the end. That was it. I knew. I knew that I would not go on another day. <laughs> I can't even talk. Uh, I knew that I wouldn't go on another day with anyone else unless, you know, she wouldn't have me. So I did everything in my power to make that not happen. Treated her with all the kindness, kindness, and uh, and uh, patience that I could, and love. And I actually had a date with a gal in Brentwood who I danced the Texas two-step with, with the other LDS kids that had gone to the Texas two-step dance, and and she I gone out with her about three times and she uh, she was a good friend. It wasn't romantic. She was a good friend. And I called her up. I had a date with her Thursday and uh, I told her that uh, I I found a girl that I'm really interested in and I won't be keeping the date Thursday. And she said, that's fine. And that's the last time I went on a date, except with Mary Ann. <laughs> and uh, so uh, that started it. We, uh, we went together for a couple of years. We had many, many good times. I'm, I'll never forget. The one time that really impressed me is when, uh, excuse me while I wipe my eyes. <laughs> well, I was, I told Mary Ann, this is when we, we were single, and, and I told Mary Ann I was going to, uh, excuse me, going to Utah to visit family and friends. And so, she says, oh, well, you know, we'd like to go visit Trina at the BYU. Trina was going to the BYU at that time. And so I said, sure, sure. So we went ahead and went to, uh, went to Utah, drove to Utah. We drove up to BYU and pulled in the parking lot that was right, really close to the uh, uh, dorm there, probably about maybe 50, maybe 40 feet away from the, the dorm door. And we pulled in and Trina just opened the door. And Trisha jumped out of the car onto the sidewalk and they both ran, full steam ahead, 
and just threw their arms around each other with hugs. And I looked at that and I thought, wow, that's a whole lot of love going on there. That really impressed me to have those two girls uh, just full of love for their self, you know, and their mom, for that matter. Well, Mary Ann and I talked extensively. We've done many, many, many things together, just super enjoyed each other's company. We were in love. There was no doubt about it, both of us in love. And so we, uh, we were very compatible. Now, I don't know how to say it any different because there was things about her when she would be thinking something and I would be thinking the same thing. And she'd say something and I would be thinking about the same thing. We've done that all through our lives. It's amazing. I, I don't know where that came from, but well, the Lord put us together and he's got a good aim. <laughs> he, the Lord knew what he was doing when he put Marianne and I together because I was able to help her a lot and she was able to help me a lot. And so anyway, we, um, we uh, talked about marriage. We said, sure, why not? And so we, <clears throat> uh, we went to, uh, we had a plan to go to the Coconut Grove in Hollywood. And I bought the ring, we both bought the ring together. Well, sort of, sort of together, but an idea of what she wanted. And so, uh, so I got the ring and we took it up to the Coconut Grove and uh, we got inside and I told the uh, fellow there that uh, I wanted a table just for two uh, somewhere. I didn't want it down in the, the normal place. And he found us a fantastic place. We had to actually walk up a couple of stairs. We had a table sitting high, actually looking down on the crowd. It was really a nice place. Uh, they were playing all kind of music, Glenn Miller and, and all the big band music, which was a blessing. And so we. I went down on one knee and presented her with the ring and asked her to marry me and she said yes. So then we prepared to get married. In my version. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> and so we, uh, excuse me, we went to, uh, Let's see, where did we go? We, we got all the preparations. We had our reception after we went to the temple. And we actually got married for time in the temple. And we came here. And What? <laughs> Say it. We came here after the temple. Wait, wait, I'm not through the temple. Oh. Okay. So, we went to the temple, we got married, and present at the temple, Rosa uh, married us in the temple, and then He sat us down and had a little talk with us. 
and he gave us many, many, many things to look towards in a marriage and how to treat each other. And, and it was a beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, saying of what he was saying about marriage and 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 that's what they do. The, the president of the temple or anyone that in the church knows and gets married in the temple, they know that they hear beautiful words from those leaders that have married them. And anyway, President Rosa says, there's one thing I want you to know in this marriage, and I want you to treat each other with kindness, 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 kindness. He said it six times. You didn't think that registered? That registered. That was cool. I thought, that is my life's goal to treat her with kindness and patience. And if, I'm not saying it was 100%, but it was almost. Right, honey? Correct, 100%. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so then we went to uh, the State Center to uh, have our reception. We had a beautiful reception out on the patio of the State Center and we had uh, we had uh, uh, oh, my Bishop Kessler came and and actually uh, Mark uh, Mark and Terry were there and they uh, Mark sang and uh, Betsy Bailey, who recently was in the Tabernacle Choir, and she's, she's retired now, but she was in the Tab Choir in Salt Lake City. And uh, she, she actually, we knew Be Betsy very well in our ward. And she, uh, she sang songs, and uh, it was just really, uh, Really pleasant. <laughs> Moving along. No, oh, no, this is Trina playing the harp. <laughs> and Trina played the harp. That's right. That was so pleasant. Trina plays the harp. She, she's a, a musical wonder. She she plays the harp. The, if you could see Grandma's pantomiming off of camera, <laughs> show us your harp pantomiming. <laughs> I know how Trina plays the harp. <laughs> <laughs> so Grandpa's trying to tell what Grandma's signaling her him with. That's funny. You're gonna be glad I said that. Believe me. No. No. no not like that. No. Well, I've got my head up and well, my shoulders. Well, your chin went up about four inches from what I said. <laughs> I'm, I'm exaggerating. <laughs> no, it went up. Yeah, there you go. It's just like that. It's just natural. Now don't move a muscle. Yeah. <laughs> just Please. Key, the key is to act the most natural. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Grandma, that is Grandma not natural. Grandma looks like she's going to cry. <laughs> no, she, no, she's being... She's a, got a smile. We're both supposed to be smiling now. <laughs> <laughs> she can't. I got things to say about happiness and smiley stuff. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Come on, freeze. What happened to you? Freeze. <laughs> yeah. Grab it. You are nothing but a statue that'll sit. <laughs> okay, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> don't worry. Okay, just now don't worry about her and you... Okay. Well, now. Going to go. <laughs> Do you know where you I, left I off? I want you to look at me right now. <laughs> <laughs> I have to keep my shoulders. <laughs> okay. I have to keep my shoulders back. And my. 
<laughs> okay, just look into the camera. <laughs> now, okay. okay, all right. Okay, say when. Is it now? Okay. My eyes are wide. Okay, now. We're on. Well, we got married. <laughs> we sure did. We got married. Oh, we were so... Happy. So happy and joyful, right, hon? We exactly. sure were, and we went to Hawaii on our honeymoon. <laughs> and I was so ecstatic about all this, and we planned a beautiful Hawaii vacation to see the islands of Hawaii. And we, <clears throat> that was my favorite, actually, Hawaii has been my favorite vacation spot forever. I love Hawaii. No matter where we go all over the world, it's always, when are we going back to Hawaii? Yeah, we've been there several times then. So, <clears throat> honey? Yes, dear? Uh, turn your face. <laughs> You said honey, so I looked at you. Oh, honey? <laughs> yes, dear. I love you so much. She puts up so much with me. It's unbelievable. I was told how to sit, hold my shoulder, and put my chin. So I'm trying to be in the right position. <laughs> Except I have tears rolling down my face from laughing. <laughs> and that's okay. Well, we really have had a lot of fun together because I decided to become a travel agent. Right, we need to talk about that a little bit, but Hawaii was first, so we decided to go to Hawaii for our vacation. We found, we found a beautiful, beautiful spot on Maui and uh, it was called Napili Surf. Except we went there on our first anniversary, not our anniversary. Oh, was that our first anniversary yeah. when we went there? We went to the island of Kauai for our honeymoon. Oh, that's right, to see the Vern Grotto. The big story was that uh, we had gone halfway around the island to get to the fern uh, no it's no called. actually we we had gone halfway around the island uh not the burn grotto but we went to, to the grand canyon, grand of, canyon the pacific. of the pacific which is on Kauai, and it looks like the grand canyon but it's obviously not quite as large but it's beautiful just beautiful and you can be up on the high, high spot and look down and you can look at the ocean down below and it's like <clears throat> there's a big valley there that goes down. <clears throat> uh, I think I'll extend this out right now before we say any more. <clears throat> we looked down at the ocean and then <clears throat> while we were on the island we took uh, we went up north later on and we took a, a, a thing called the Zodiac Ride. And it was a rubber raft, nine man rubber raft, big raft, very safe. It was sponsored by the uh, Coast Guard, so it was really good. And we <clears throat> went on the North Shore. Uh, you could actually see the North Shore from the Princess Hotel, which is a... Uh, Princeville. Princeville Hotel. Yeah. Magnificent hotel. Beautiful hotel. And, and there's <clears throat> ways to sit out on the veranda and you can look at the North Shore in Kauai and <clears throat> see all of the volcanic rock where <clears throat> the lava had flowed and uh, and it was just all volcanic rock with many, many caves uh, right there at the water's level. Well, <clears throat> we took this Zodiac ride uh, and uh, 
we were traveling in and out of the cave. That the lava had produced because uh, it's a volcano there. Yeah. And so the lava has come down and made these caves. And when you first start the Zodiac, there's about three beautiful beaches on the way. And then uh, we started going into the cave. One of them was so big, the cave, uh, the entrance didn't look that big, but the fellow on the Zodiac had gone in there and he knew that the water level was good, so we'd be safe to go in. And we went in and uh, it was like a football stadium on the inside. It, was it even big. had an island in the middle. Well, no, that's another one. Oh. This one was just plain football field like and he took his uh, raft practically full speed and went all the way around that great big opening, uh, not an opening, but a cave, uh, a uh, football field sized cave. And then we came out and then we went a little farther and there was, a, I think, a hole in the rock, wasn't there? <coughs> Where the water splashed through. And then just on the other side of that was another cave, and we went in that cave, and what was inside that cave was a real special place, because we went inside the cave, as we went in a ways, all of a sudden, it was skylight. You could see the sun and the blue sky, and it was a big, big skylight. And in the middle of that was an island. And, and so he took the rubber raft around that island, and then he said, anybody wants to snorkel, they can. So we got out, and we snorkeled, and, uh, and Mary Ann and I snorkeled, and it was great snorkeling in there. I mean, it was special, really a special deal. I have to tell you something funny. When I told my mother that we were going to go on a raft, she got so terrified because she was thinking about a wooden raft like in Tom Sawyer, <coughs> you know, where they paddled on the side. <laughs> when I, I had to show her a picture of this huge rubber raft to calm her down. <laughs> yeah. But, but then we went, when we went to the Grand Canyon of the Pacific, I'll tell this story. Yeah. They had a little restaurant inside. Uh, it and, was like a lodge. Yeah. And you had to drive down to it. You could actually see it from the, uh, from the road, which was, it was way down in the bottom of the little valley. <clears throat> we go tooling along there, and I says, wouldn't, wouldn't you like to... Wouldn't you like to stop and get maybe a papaya and ice cream or something? Because we'd had those already and they were really good. So Marianne says, yeah, let's do that. Nothing and like Hawaiian pineapple. I mean papaya. Papaya, oh yeah, yeah fantastic. And so <clears throat> anyway, we went in and we had this really nice um, uh, lunch. And then we go to pay... And guess and what? Gordon forgot his wallet and left it in the hotel. And so uh, I didn't bring my purse she, because here was I with this uh, new husband who's going to take care of everything. Guess yeah, who right. had to go tell the waitress we couldn't pay? It was me. And I explained the situation and she said... Don't worry about it, just mail it to us. So we're going back and we're actually in Lahui, and, uh, which is the main town there. <clears throat> and we had the idea, well, let's stop. I've got a, a bank account and surely we can get some money out of the bank. Yeah. But because we had no identification, either one of us, they wouldn't give us. The they money. wouldn't give us any money. Well, it so happened that 
a man heard our dilemma and as we were walking out of the bank, he said, here, take this $5 and get your gas because we didn't have enough to get back to our hotel. And so we just, well, well we how can we do money. it? We have to be able to pay you back. And he said, well, don't worry about it, but if you feel you have to, here's my card. And he gave us his card, and he was the state senator from Hawaii, the U.S. senator. And he gave us the $5 we that got. That impressed me. Of the leadership of Hawaii. Yeah, <laughs> and so we um, got back to the hotel and immediately wrote checks to, to both places. And um, so that was kind of the beginning of a lot of fiascos that we found ourselves in over the years. But And we did send the money back to the hotel. <laughs> yeah. Or did we... Did we give it to him the next time we went? No, we mailed it. We mailed it. Yeah, to we both. We mailed it to the little lodge there in Hawaii. And we felt better about that. But we... Um, I always believed in uh, Abe Lincoln uh, weighing out the... Uh, he worked in the grocery store and he weighed out this uh, older lady's product, rice or whatever it was, and he found out uh, after she left that the scale was not correct, and uh, he walked over to her house and gave her back the difference in the money. And that really impressed me with Abraham Lincoln because he was... Uh, uh, <clears throat> Honest Abe. Honest Abe. And the reason they called him that, he read the Bible, he knew the Bible he read the Bible a lot, and a Abraham Lincoln knew the Bible, and 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 he he was a very impressive man. Oh, by the way, I was born the same day he was. Yes, February twelfth, nineteen thirty-five. Right, Lincoln's <laughs> birthday. But he it, it left me a a legacy of him and what he stood for, and I wanted to stand, you know, have his honesty. My dad was very honest. He was a very honest man. And Gordon's been honest in everything he's done. But then mm -hmm. I, became, I became a travel agent. And oh, no, wait a minute now. That's too quick. <laughs> I, I'm going to tell you this story. I'm just, <clears throat> we're sitting in the living room and Marianne looks over at me and says, would it be okay if I went to travel agent school? And I thought a minute and I thought, well, that'd be good. Yeah, yeah, if you want to, that sounds good to me. You know, n new learning and positive and good. So I, uh, <clears throat> I says, sure. And, and she says, well, my mom's interested and she would like to go with me. And I said, that would be great. You could both go together. Go ahead, hon. Yeah, and so we did go together. And um, after we graduated, uh, I decided that uh, I wanted to do some different tours uh, with people. And so my mom got a computer and she made up my flyers for me and did all this mailing. Now, she was almost 80. And back then, no one even had computers. And um, she taught herself how to use it. She made these mailers for me. And she went out and mailed them for all these tours that I did. And... Um, she was just uh, a wonderful organizer, go-getter. If she decided she was going to do something, boy, she did it. And so my business grew like crazy, and we were able to travel all over the world. <clears throat> Probably the neatest thing that we did was for years we did 
a church history tour for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and we started on the East Coast, and we ended up normally in um, in the uh, Cleveland area, you know. And uh, but then we did them where we she, uh, ended up in Illinois, uh, in Nauvoo. But um, it was an exciting time for us. What are some of the things we saw, honey? That really uh, left you with an impression. You know... You mean on the church history tour? No, just on our tours all over the world. Well... Well, we had we had an experience that was uh, unique. Uh, of course, all the church history... Uh, uh, she, she hired a bus that held 50 people. I mean, this wasn't a small tour. She would have 50 anywhere from 30 to 50 people on the buses and she would travel anywhere. We traveled anywhere from Vermont, where Joseph Smith was born, and we came through through New York and all the way across, uh, how far south did we go there? New we York and we went to, oh, we Illinois. Went to Virginia. We went to uh, where where the pilgrims came and connected that to the church history tour. And we went on to Ohio. Yeah, we saw the Plymouth Rock. <laughs> we saw the Plymouth Rock. That's right. And uh, we we gone to oh, uh, all of the uh, halfway across the United States. Yeah, all the way over to, like she said, Cleveland, Ohio. And Nauvoo, Illinois. Oh, and yeah, Nauvoo, Illinois by Quincy. And the Quincy uh, City people really helped the saints when they were in dire needs and being uh, 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 hurt and uh, put upon by, by actually uh, Go Governor Boggs. But anyway, it was really... Uh, quite an experience to go on all these church history tours and I learned so much because she had uh, a, nur a narrator on the bus that uh, gave us all the information as we came to different yeah. spots. And Nauvoo was one of our favorite spots. Our, our friend uh, Jack and Barbara Renoff were, were in charge of the pageant there and so we got some good seats there, and and it was just wonderful uh, to go to uh, Nauvoo and, and see them. We actually stayed overnight with them uh, at a time, and and so we just really enjoyed that. Well, Gordon, oh, um, we went to Israel with BYU, but then I took a tour, my own tour there, but. Gordon couldn't go. I've got to tell you this story before she goes any farther. When we went to Israel, I I was packing it was kind of older clothes because I thought it was the desert. <laughs> I found him with all his and old I, clothes in the suitcase and I said, what are you packing? <laughs> this is ridiculous. <laughs> and so, so then she... <clears throat> She uh, got me some good clothes, and we went to Israel. I was shocked because it was it was uh, beautiful and green. It was it was beautiful and green. They had a beautiful vegetable, uh, fantastic. And then they had a Mount Hermon, is eight thousand feet plus high, and. Uh, and there was two rivers coming out of uh, Mount Hermon, one on each side of the mountain. And it was like, if you've ever been to uh, uh, Brian, Brighton Canyon in, uh, in Utah, with that big of a river coming down the, and a little cottonwood as well. 
And so they were big, good-sized rivers. You couldn't jump across them. And uh, it was interesting that the one on the right side as we went up, that's where Dan uh, had his village up there, halfway up there in the Bible, uh, the prophet Daniel. And, uh, and so they called that the Dan River. And, and then as we went down, the two rivers joined together into a fork, you know. And, and the river on the left was called the Jor. And so now, if you combine them, Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River, and that's what it was. The Jor and the Dan went together and made the Jordan River. And so that was the, uh, that, the famous Jordan River in, in the Bible. And so I thought that was, that, to me, that was fantastic. I love yeah. that. Honey, you asked me what my favorite uh, trips were, and there were so many. I'll have to, I'll go through a, a lot of them. Just go, wait, let her, let her ask it. I, I haven't asked you yet. Let her ask film. it, so it's on. Oh, you didn't ask? Oh, no. I thought you did. Well, I, okay. um, <laughs> after I became a travel agent, and while we were doing our tours, I decided to specialize in cruising. And because we went on all these cruises, we were able to stop at so many ports all around the world and be able to see so many things. And um, we'll be just watching TV and we'll go, oh, honey, we've been there. We've been there. We've been there. And it's so exciting now. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to do this. We're on film. You're supposed to ask me a question. Well, I am right now. Okay. What are some of the exciting places that we went to without going into too much detail? Not too much detail. Okay, let's see. All right. Uh, excuse me. Um, well, of course, Italy. I loved Italy. He's half Italian. I'm half Italian. And I I feel like I should tell about the city on the hill, that little story. But I'm just going to go through. There was a, a trip that we took. <clears throat> uh, we had a free trip uh, on a cruise. And we could go anywhere. And I wanted to go on the most expensive one. I thought, why not? They give us an option. So the most expensive one was to uh, uh, was to New uh, New Brunswick, uh, Nova Scotia, uh, down the uh, St. Lawrence route to um, Quebec and Montreal. And so what we did <coughs> We uh, we went there. Uh, that was the that was one of the best. That was actually the first cruise we took, honey. Was it the first? Yeah, that was the very first cruise. Yeah, that. Well, was let me quickly tell you what happened there. Uh, we. It wasn't that expensive. We no. got there, honey. It was the most expensive cruise that we looked at. I'm telling you, I know that it was the most expensive cruise. Well, I mean, unless you're going around the world. Oh. Well, we're talking seven days, you know, oh, okay. whatever. But anyway, <clears throat> so we got on the ship at, uh, was it New York or Maine? New York, I think. Anyway, we, we went on to a place in New Brunswick, which is on the way to Montreal. And uh, in New Brunswick... Uh, there's a, um, the name of the, uh, the Bay of Funday, which has, the Bay has of Funday, Bunday, Funday, Funday, is it? Bundy, yeah, B Bundy, yeah, 
And so it they has, have the highest tide in the world, which is 65 feet. And I had learned that when I was in school, and I never forgot it. And one reason that we got this cruise was because we had been on one in Alaska with our friends Joan and Archie. But and we're not Archie, tell that story. Huh? Well, Archie had gotten very sick, and there were some problems, and so they gave us a cruise where we only had to pay half. And I that's like, why we picked the, yeah, I was the cruise. Leave that out, but that's okay. Well, honey, I've already put it in. That's right. <laughs> and so anyway, uh, we got there and we were on the bus and we were parked in front of a pond in New Brunswick at the Bay of Bundy. And uh, we heard about the 65 feet um, tide. Tide. But I learned about it in school, remember? And yeah. I wanted to do, that's the one shore excursion I wanted to do. And it was the, the biggest tide in the world. And so that was going to be interesting. So we stopped there and there was a nice lake with a little mill building by it. And then we, uh, the bus driver said, well, we're going to go up at the top and have some soup. When you get through with your soup, we'll come down. See that, see that river you're looking at? And this massive river, really high, high current river coming down into the lake. And it's, it's a mover. It's really moving. And he said, that river will be going in reverse when we come to the bottom. And I could not believe that. To me, that was amazing. So, I... Now, when we got uh, to the restaurant where we stopped, there were all these boats moored and all this water and everything. And what happened by the time we came out of the restaurant? Oh, yeah, the boats were uh, in the water at one point and then flat on the mud. And the other point. Right, because the tide, the tide came had out. Moved. <laughs> and so we went on down, looked at the river, it was totally in reverse. Yeah, because now all the water was rushing out. And I mean, we're talking a river probably 20 feet wide, just rushing. And I oh, was it was, amazed. Oh, oh, it was I wider was totally than that. Amazed. And, then, and then actually we went. Uh, Another place on uh, in New Brunswick where we actually walked. The fellow that uh, took us there, kind of like a, a tour guide, came in and he says, "You're now walking on the ocean floor because the tide had gone completely out, and we were actually walking on the ocean floor <laughs> at that point." So we thought that was really interesting, yeah. and. Uh, yeah, we did almost 50 cruises, and so I was just thought I'd tell you some of the places we went, and then Gordon can tell you what some, is, some of his favorites were. Um, <coughs> of course, we went on both coasts of the United States. We went through the Panama Canal twice, uh, so that put us in some South American countries. Uh, we went to Hawaii. We went to Alaska many times. We just love that cruise. And um, then we did a transatlantic where we went from Florida to England. Um, we've done the Baltic Ocean, uh, the Baltic Sea, where we've seen all the Scandinavian countries. Went to St. Petersburg, Russia. So that was exciting. Up the Baltic. Yeah, we, we've done the um, Caribbean many times, and um, we went to the uh, Tahitian Islands, and um, uh, went to Tahiti, Morea, Bora all, Bora. A Bora Bora. I got sick in Bora Bora, so Gordon went with a friend, and they got on a 
a wave runner and went all around while I lay in bed very We ill. actually went past Marlon Brando's little villages. He had, he had these little houses built on the lagoon uh, that you could actually stay in. Even now you can stay in those. And uh, we went past those on our wave runner and that was kind of yeah. good news, I guess. <laughs> It was beautiful, actually. But, uh, was, that, that lagoon was just calm, clear, beautiful blue skies. And yeah, Bora we Bora was quite a place. Oh, it was. As yeah, I looked yeah, out so, my bedroom window with a fever. That, that <laughs> was one of my favorite places, Bora Bora there. I love that. But uh, uh, we've been to the Caribbean, out through the Bermuda Triangle. Mm -hmm. uh, we visited uh, uh, Africa. Uh, the, the only place that we haven't gone is to uh, Asia. Uh, although we did see Russia. So Russia used to be part of Asia. I don't know how it goes these days. <laughs> so anyway, um, as I said, it's so much fun when we watch TV to just think we were there, we visited there. That was, it's just an exciting thing to think because I came a travel agent and went to school, learned that, which was in my, I think early sixties, we've been able to, uh, do all this travel and, and it's been wonderful. Yeah. Okay, uh, Italy was one of my favorite stops and uh, when, this time when we went to Italy, uh, we, uh, we went to uh, um, Rome, we flew into Rome, uh, Another time we went to Italy, I'm going to tell you about this one first. We flew into London, we took the channel, channel, under uh, the English Channel, then we went to Paris, France, across to Switzerland, and we wanted to meet uh, um, we wanted to meet Earl Skinner. Honey, had I mentioned this? What, honey? Earl Skinner and Grindelwald. Uh, no. And so we, uh, we met Earl Skinner and his wife Nadine, and he'd been there eight years, and he uh, 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 made a deal with us because uh, we were talking here in the States here, in California with Earl and I was good friends with him and he says, hey, you want to go to Switzerland? Yeah. And he says, why don't you come and split a chalet with us? And so we paid half for the chalet and he had it all arranged because he'd been there eight years before and he had uh, uh, taken the uh, 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 picked out a beautiful place called Grindelwald, which is like a dead-end city, but it's so beautiful there. Mount Iger with a famous mountain, and we looked at that over our patio uh, in the front. We were on the second floor, so it was like a little mini patio, veranda-like type thing, excuse me. And so, so we, uh, we went there, we saw uh, many things, we uh, went through the town and they had these window boxes and all the flowers were all fresh and red and they had one of the cleanest underground restrooms I'd ever been in. I couldn't believe how clean it was. Uh, Earl took us to the cemetery which had the the headstones on each grave and each grave had a flower bed on it and there was not a dead flower on the flower beds 
and this was a good sized cemetery. I was amazed at this cemetery. And on the headstone, they had lasered in their jobs, whatever they were, farmer, there was a tractor, doctors had his equipment. It was really, really interesting. Well, also we took the cog train up to uh, Mount, uh, uh, where we could see Grindelwald. Up to, uh, well, we went, took the cog, cog train up and walked along a pathway to a big lodge that had a big veranda, big one, and had a big table there. And so we ate spaghetti sitting on that veranda with the blue sky and the sun out looking at the Matterhorn and it was full of snow. And surprisingly, there wasn't any snow where we walked. So the snow had fallen and melted mostly, but there was three glaciers on our left, and the Matterhorn was fully snowed under. We got to see that beautiful scene. And that was a wonderful thing. Earl took us to a lot of wonderful places. He knew the language, so that was special. This other time we flew into Rome, Italy, and we looked at all of the uh, Roman uh, things, and then we uh, we drove down to uh, to Naples. We rented a car, and we went into a city called Agnone. It looks like a city on a hill, and there are only like forty thousand people there and uh, there wasn't any towns around for 50 miles so it was a town on a hill by itself and uh, <clears throat> that's where my ancestries were that's why we went there we wanted to see the ancestries my mom and sister and and brother-in-law Dar uh, Bonnie and Darnell had gone there 12 years earlier and I got, I sent letters to Italy and by way of a, a fellow in our church, Scott Haskins, he uh, did artwork in Italy and he translated all of the letters into Italian and sent them for me. And so two of the letters arrived. So I had a connection when I went there and we went to the first house and knocked on the door. There was a couple of people. They said, come back at 2 o'clock. We went back at 2 o'clock, and they had 16 people there. So we went in. They, they fed us. They, uh, we lined them up and took pictures of them. And then I had Mary Ann stand behind each one of them and get their name, spell it correctly, on all 16 people. So when we went home, we were able to put those people together and for genealogy. And uh, he, uh, <clears throat> we went to another house the next day and it was, uh, <clears throat> it was a little nicer place. Uh, had an upstairs and we went there and uh, we asked for my uh, Aunt Carolina. And so we were upstairs and she said, well, Carolina is working in the garden. So she came upstairs and she was a very short woman, very short, and 101 years old. And I'm going, wow, 101. And she, uh, she gave and she motioned for for me to come over. Uh, there was a uh, daughter or a niece, uh, Carla, had given me uh, translation to Italy to English. Uh, I could talk to Carla and she could communicate to my aunt, and her uh, Mercedes was. Uh, they owned the house, and there was a couple of other gals there, 
I, I forget their name right now, but uh, he, uh, Aunt Carolina asked me to come over and give her a kiss and a hug to send back to, uh, he, she called her Jenna, which is Jane in American. So I, I went over and I gave her a hug and a kiss and she gave me a kiss and a hug and she was rather fragile so I had to be careful. And uh, that was a special time. My grandfather was Raphael Della Quadri and that was his sister. I never met my grandfather. He died when I was uh, born, but I met his sister in Agnone, Italy, where he grew up. So that was a special thing. And so that was our turn in Italy, so made Italy a, a very special place. So uh, there was many, many special places that we traveled. And, you know, uh, he's been so hard working. Um, uh, so generous with his time to just, uh, when I met Gordon, I had just bought our home, um, just bought it, and uh, they were building it the, for, on our first day, I brought him over, was going to show him, and they had just locked it because they put in the uh, uh, appliance and so forth. And little did we know that for 33 years we'd be living in this home. Oh, here we go again. <laughs> we keep forgetting to turn off the phone. Yeah. Is that poor Tricia? Call from Gregory Sharp. Hello, I'm giving my video. Goodbye. <laughs> that Greg. Sharp. Yeah, mm -hmm. great sharp. here, hand me the phone and I'll turn it off, honey. Uh, oh, that oh. that was Gordon's son, Todd, but oh. his real name is Gregory. Oh. So, <laughs> anyway, um, uh, he's kept our home so lovely. He worked so hard. He worked till he was 67 at his job. And then ever since, people wonder, what do you do when you retire? Well, Gordon has just worked to keep our home nice and lovely all the time. And we've had so many fantastic gatherings here every New Year's. Every New Year's. Yeah, we have a combination New Year's. Well, uh, we decided that when, uh, when family had their Christmas, they would have it there at their home. Everybody decided to have it at their home. Of course, uh, Trina was close and and uh, Louisa was close and uh, Trisha was close. So we kind of visited them a little bit. We'd actually go over to Trina's and have Eggs Benedict every uh, morning for breakfast, which was a tradition through their whole life. And, uh, and and so what uh, we come to conclude that we would all get together on New Year's and everybody could come to our house and visit and celebrate. Uh, first of all, we'd have our, we'd have our uh, dinner, we'd eat dinner, then we'd have our elephant gifts. And, uh, the elephant game. And then we'd have our uh, regular gifts that we passed around to those that we hadn't given gifts to. And then after that, we would uh, go uh, celebrate uh, uh, the New Year's. When it came in on the TV, we'd have TV on. Bells and whistles, Marianne made sure we had lots of bells and whistles to... to uh, Celebrate with Celebrate hats. with. We'd go outside and the kids would beat the pans and <laughs> make all kinds of noise. Actually, the neighbors start doing it too. So well, the neighbors always come out to watch because they know. 
And as the years have gone by, our family has just grown and grown and grown. We have over 70 now. And uh, at our party, we're usually somewhere, <coughs> we've averaged around 50 uh, for then those that, that could house. and couldn't come. Yeah. And um, uh, uh, Gordon has been so sweet, always so sweet to me. And I think something that's really bound us together is our love of God, of our church, um, and then... We, Jesus Christ. And we just have so much... Uh, compatibility. We love to movies, we love plays and music, and of course once we started cruising, we loved that. And uh, Gordon, when I met him, he just loved tennis so much. And um, I took tennis in college, but all we did was hit a ball against a wall. So I really learned now to love tennis. We go to Indian Wells to the big uh, Masters tournament there. Now and you have to know one thing. When we first got married, Marianne had a job going to. Uh, first, she uh, she was in charge of uh, Black Bart's ice cream. Yeah. And she was the manager there, and she opened and closed the place, and she uh, uh, <coughs> had uh, Trina and, and Trisha working there and uh, others, friends and LDS people. And so we had, I could go over and get a really good almond ice cream. And yeah, we put chocolate on the bars with almond. And it was almond. special. Yeah. So, so anyway, uh, we, from there, she, she decided that she would, uh, well, I became the manager. You became yeah, the manager, but was that before or after your uh, uh, your guitar playing? No, it was after, wasn't it? No, it was before. Uh, well, mean, you, they you, were simultaneous. Yeah. Yes, yeah, they were she, going on together. Yeah, that's right. She would go play. She actually worked at the Orange County uh, School District as a music appreciation teacher and so she would uh, take her guitar and uh, all of her music and she would play songs at uh, geriatric wards, uh, senior centers, uh, different places. I was a music therapist for the elderly. And, so. it, was, and it was such a joy for me to go there and see these people in wheelchairs all down and out, looking down and looking kind of depressed. Marianne would walk in the door. The announcement was made that Marianne was here. And those people just brightened up. Let's go see Marianne. <laughs> and we'd go in and, uh, and, we, and she, she uh, got me to sing solo. His first actual performing with White Christmas sounding just like Bing Crosby. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I used to like to sing Bing Crosby and now I've had people uh, request that on Christmas and I'll sing it. But the big but, thing was I got him up on a cruise ship because he had this trio he liked to sing with um, Nat King Cole, Al Josen, and the Big Bopper. And he blended them all in one. And the first time that we did it on a cruise ship, we had, the pianist could play in any key in any song. Oh my gosh, he played with Gordon. I made Gordon get up on the stage in front of all these people, and he did do the Big Bopper. Hello? Uh, this is your big bop I speaking. <laughs> Do I what? Will I what? Oh, baby, you know what I like. Chantilly lace and 
pretty face, ponytail hanging down. She, she jiggled when she walked. She just blah, blah, blah. Makes the girl go round, round, round. Makes the girl go round, round, round. Ain't nothing in. Ain't nothing like a big eyed girl. Act so funny and spend my money. She feels real loose, just like a long neck gift. Oh, baby, that's the one I like. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, ah. you know, I'm getting older now. I can't yeah. do it as well. But anyway, I wanted to tell you about this gal. She played the guitar. She was a music major in college. And she played, she played the guitar. She played, uh, she actually played the uh, clarinet. Um, clarinet in her high school uh, band and she played the saxophone in a band and she actually played uh, the, uh, uh, well, she plays the piano. So she's, she's a master of uh, music. Oh, and she does have her masters in her travel agent business. She mm -hmm. actually uh, acquired a master's certificate in travel. And so this gal here is, uh, she was right down my line when it come to music, because I love music. Yeah, we've had a lot of fun with music over the years. We well, certainly have. <laughs> you guys uh, like to dance together. So yes. Oh, we dance and dance and dance. Uh, yeah, the dancing, I'll tell you, we did the, we, we like to do the 40s swing. And uh, just like you see in the movies, you know, except we were a little old for him to throw me up in the air. But <laughs> other than that, we did all the twirling and the wiggling. And we did the fun stuff. Yeah. So, any other questions, um, Louisa? Well, what have been some of your favorite TV shows you've, that you've really gotten into and watched together? Well, one uh, I know was Nashville that we watched <laughs> the whole way through. Yeah, we watched yeah. Nashville. We uh, like it was a great uh, one about Western music, but also kind of a good soap opera. I love medical shows, but Gordon doesn't like any of those. Well, so, a soapbox. Well, I'm yeah. Not, I'm not a soapbox person. In, it's not, it's in not Utah, that I didn't... I didn't my medical, because I actually drove ambulance for two years, something I hadn't brought up, but I did drive ambulance, and that's before they had paramedics. So we would actually pick up the patient, take him to the hospital, and then they'd be treated. And I saved a couple of lives, so that felt felt good in my life. And uh, so anyway, I just wanted to mention that that I it did. I didn't mind the medical end of it. I just, uh, I'm not a soapbox person. In Utah, what they call the soapbox, or Gordon did, it's like what we call the soap operas, the daytime dramas, like that always used to be so popular and still are, you know. Uh, and so, when he first started talking about soapbox, that's a soapbox, I was like, that was some Utah expression that I had to get used to. Anyway, I'm, I'm going to interject this because I didn't say this before. When I was younger, my mom used to let me kind of come in a little late. And I'd always go over to the Paradise Inn because they, it was a nice cream parlor really close to our house. Well, they made it into a beer joint. And my uncle, who was a bachelor, never got married, he'd come in there and he'd drink his beer and he'd get drunk. And he would walk home with me when the place closed about 10 o'clock. Gordon wasn't there. Gordon helped him home. What? <laughs> well, you said that he'd walk home with you like you were in the bar with him. No, he he would walk home with me, leaning on me, because he lived at our house. Yeah. Uh, Uncle Bert lived in the summer kitchen behind our house. And I think I mentioned that before, but anyway, I didn't, 
I don't think I told this story that he, one time he came in and he was leaning on me a little heavy. And I was worried about him because I knew he was drank a lot. Now I have to interject here. I would sit in there because they'd give me candy and all kinds of goodies. Buy me an ice cream cone and I would sit in there and listen to all these stories. These sad, sad, sad stories. What did the attorney And it was, and it was like, a, <laughs> like soap operas, basically. I mean, I was young. I was probably about six, I don't know, five, six, seven, maybe seven, probably. And probably pretty young, actually. And uh, I used to listen to these things. And it stuck into my mind to the point where I did not want to listen to any of those sad stories. And that's what a soapbox does for me. <laughs> and when I took him home and we went in our kitchen door, he was standing there. Mom says, you got to go to bed. You go to bed right now. And I just looked up at him and I didn't didn't move and I usually moved when my mom said to go to bed and <clears throat> I just looked up at him and I looked at her and he says I looked back up at him and he says you better go to bed and mind your mom do what you told and I says okay so I took about three steps and he fell like a tree <laughs> fell flat on his face down the but steps. he was, honey, our our kitchen floor had so much give as like a trampoline. On the floor. <laughs> That's why they, everybody liked to dance on it because it gave. <laughs> and when he, he hit the floor, of course, it gave didn't hurt him at all. Oh, good. He was so drunk it didn't make any difference <laughs> for him. And so that's my story. I had to interject that, and that's why I never liked. I think I never liked yeah. any. So what have been shows you have so liked watching. watching together? Survivor. Or oh, Love Survivor. Survivor. Amazing Race. Mm. <laughs> and um, Jeopardy. Jeopardy. New shows. Wheel of Fortune. <laughs> I love that show. Uh, New shows we've watched uh, just America, about American Idol, Idol uh, America's Got Talent. We've watched all these NCIS shows, and yeah. um, uh, but we especially love to watch old movies. And Gordon. Uh, They'll tell me, honey, it's in black and white. I know you don't like black and white. And I'll go, honey, it's okay. Okay. <laughs> well, I got, later in life, I've really gotten into the old movies back in the 30s and the 40s. So I've been watching a lot of those. Of course, I, really I remember like so much of them. But we just watched and laughed so hard was Annie Get Your Gun with uh, Betty Hutton. Oh my gosh, we really enjoyed that. That was a good. It was it was a zany thing, but it was good. <laughs> yeah, I know. And she was so good. And Gordon loves Doris Day. And I don't oh, think yeah. I told you she died today at ninety seven. Oh, she died today, huh? Ninety seven. Oh wow. Yeah. She's uh -huh. oh, was one of his little loves. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and actually, uh Oh, we, Singing in the Rain was one of my favorites. Did you guys see it at La Mirada? Oh yeah. my gosh. Oh, what's it was the I'm, best. I, it's it the was best show we've ever seen To there. be on stage. I felt like that was the best show I've ever seen, period. Yes. It was uh, amazing. Well, we have a tape now and we watched it already. And we're saving it because I don't want it to ever go off until I, I go Well, in. we watched it when we I came home. It. And it was like word for word. Yeah, they, they did they the same totally dialogue. True to it. Yeah. Oh, we were just Don, Donald O'Connor in that in that show was he was just 
Excellent. Yeah. Well, let's. let's uh, let me let on. me just ask, um, Grandma, what's been something fun or interesting about being married to Grandpa? Oh, fun or interesting? Hmm. Well, it's all been fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's been interesting because being mar uh, growing up in Utah was different than here. So we've kind of had to um, mesh ways of California and Utah <laughs> yeah. thinking on some things, you know. But um, I think what's been fun is that... Um, we're older, we've raised kids, we haven't had the, the conflict of, uh, especially these last few years, of having to make a living. And um, so we've just been able to uh, relax and enjoy ourselves because yeah. he retired at 67. So we've had over 15 years and we've been lucky because his mother left us money, my mother left us money, and his uncle left him money. And so even though we've just worked all our life hand to mouth, we've, we've had these inheritances. None of them were large, but they've been enough with our Social Security that we've been able to just... Um, uh, not live some lavish lifestyle, but just be comfortable where and we didn't I, have to I, worry about it. I attribute not having any financial problems when I started paying 100% tithing. Yes. I pay 100%. I don't care if I've paid it again before, but when I make when we have money coming in, it gets tied, and I, I am someone that can say this, that before that, my financial conditions, of course, I stabilized it after I, after I was single, because because I was, uh, my credit rating was gone due to my previous marriage. And I had to stabilize all that. But that's when I started paying tithing. As soon as I was single, I paid 100% tithing. I do it now. And uh, I believe that the Lord's on my side who can be against you? And he's helping me with my finances. We have not, we have had finances pop in. We had a thousand dollars come from this, no, nine thousand dollars come from the state that was money in there waiting for Mary Ann. I think it was you. Yes. It, it, Mary yeah. Ann was waiting, and I put in two, and I got. I think four, four hundred or something out of that. Oh, you know, our minds have been put on a track, a financial track that j just, it's unbelievable. And I, I'll tell you about this sweet woman here. Uh, I, I, you know, there's, I don't know if there's enough adjectives for me to say positive things about her. And you know, I have to hand it to her mother. Her mother brought her up so well. My mother really loved me. She That's loved something you I knew. And, and you can feel that love through Mary Ann. I mean, I was so impressed with Grandma Kathleen. Of course, you have to remember, I was an only child, so it was all thrust on me. I didn't have to divide with anyone. And I was so anyone. protective uh, of her mother to do all this. 
And she, I just wish I had a, a beforehand gotten all these words, but she's kind, gentle, sharing, charitable, patient, loving, uh, did I say generous? Uh, there's so many things about her. And you know, when I first saw her face, I saw a lot of this in her face. And I can't tell you how I did. I think the good Lord helped me. <laughs> and I could not have been blessed with a most more wonderful woman in my life is Marianne. And my mom is up there too, but Marianne is unbelievably beautiful. She's beautiful. She's a gorgeous woman. And, and besides being humble and just a very, very thoughtful all the time of others all the time of me wow I mean really she is so this kid is with it <laughs> <laughs> I love her so much we can do better than that I don't know if we can, can we? <laughs> Well, honey, that that was so sweet. Um, yeah, yeah, we've had a wonderful 33 years together. Um, yeah. I had never planned on marrying again, but this dashing guy just <laughs> knocked me off my feet. <laughs> yeah. Same here for you. <laughs> And uh, what did you ever? And uh, uh, he's been just a wonderful husband, uh, the best grandpa and, and dad to my children. Um, we just couldn't have asked for better. Um, he's really the only grandpa most of them have ever known. I just want to say to my sweetheart that we've just had our 33rd wedding anniversary. How much I love you. And you have been the most wonderful husband and grandpa and father that any girl could ever want. And thank you for 33 wonderful, wonderful years. <laughs> yeah. Did her coming from me. <laughs> <laughs>